Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, February 27th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. In today's diary, we do have a guest diary by Keegan Hamlin, one of our interns. And uh, Keegan is writing about how to automate some of uh, the malware analysis with our honeypot. We are using the Cowrie honeypot and it does collect any attempts to upload binaries or any file really to the honeypot. And of course, uh, there is malware among those binaries. The tricky part is to serve a quick triage on what's interesting, what's new. Virus Total's API comes in really handy here. You may just use it to submit a hash of the file and then you'll get back some basic uh, properties that Virus Total knows about the file. As a rule of thumb, well, if Virus Total has a record of the particular hash, it's probably not that terribly interesting, even less interesting if there are a lot of hits in existing anti-malware engines. Now, once you make it past this step, there's an interesting additional step that uh, is being explained here, and that's the behavioral or dynamic analysis of the files and here using any run. Any run is a service that you can use uh, to then uh, quickly basically run a file and get a quick report as to what it does. Works pretty well. And uh, then in addition to that, you have tools that you can sort of deploy yourself like uh, Mockingbird or uh, Cuckoo 3, which uh, are also allowing you to get a quick behavioral snapshot of some unknown malware. Some of these uh, sort of on-premise systems, of course, uh, take a little bit of uh, work uh, to get set up and uh, configure. They often require like a set of different virtual machines and the necessary automation to then periodically reset everything. Again, this is sort of more sort of a triage uh, kind of function. Of course, a lot of malware these days also detects some of these environments and may not properly run inside them. And then we have uh, two interesting vulnerabilities in common Wi-Fi implementations. They were discovered by Matthew Van Hoof, who has discovered other prior vulnerabilities in Wi-Fi implementations. They do affect WPA2 as well as 3. The first vulnerability, it's probably the one that's more widespread. It's in WPA Supplicant, which is the WPA implementation that you typically find on Linux. The problem here is that an attacker is able to set up a rogue access point that claims to be a trusted access point to the client. This at first doesn't sound like such a big deal. You basically just have to set up an access point with the right SSID. But what makes it a bigger deal is that this affects PEEP, the protected intensible authentication protocol that's first supposed to cryptographically verify that you're connecting to the correct uh, access point with based out of a certificate scheme. Well, uh, that is not properly implemented in WPA supplicant. So the end result is that an attacker only needs to get the SSID right, just like with any sort of home access point and that PEEP protection does not really work. Again, this affects pretty much Linux. The second vulnerability is a vulnerability in IWD. IWD is used in Access Point. It's Intel's iNet wireless daemon. And well, the problem here is that an attacker is able to connect to an access point without actually providing any credentials. There's a somewhat embarrassing vulnerability here is when the attacker is just basically providing null as a credential, so no credentials at all, well, access will be granted due to an implementation vulnerability. And well, for more details, see the respective blog post. Patches should be available from your respective operating system and wireless access point vendors. 
And researchers at Guardio Labs wrote a blog post about uh, what they're saying is an increase in malicious spam originating from subdomains. So what's happening here is that attackers are using subdomains from trusted brands. They're mentioning here VMware, McAfee, CBS, eBay, and the like. And these emails are passing all the spam checks like SPF and DKIM. The trick here is at least in part related to abandoned domains. For example, you used some kind of email service in the past. You did add records to your SPF record to indicate that it's okay for that email service to send email. Later, that email service went out of business. They gave up their domain. You never updated your SPF record. And now that service is able to then still send mail on your behalf if someone is just resurrecting the domain. They found a total of 8,000 domains so far that are susceptible uh, to uh, this particular attack. They also set up a quick checker that you can use uh, to basically check if your domain is potentially susceptible to uh, this vulnerability. Well, and this is it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.